cyber insurance claims and what you need to know about them. That's today's topic on the MSP Zone. You're entering the MSP Zone, a podcast for the managed services community, covering news, analysis, and interviews from around the globe. Elevate your MSP game by staying in the MSP Zone. And now, your host, Charles Weaver. It's that time of the week again. We're talking about cyber insurance. We're talking about cyber liability, cyber attacks, and we're talking about what steps you as an MSP, either on your own behalf or on behalf of your customers, what steps you ought to consider and what steps you ought to take as you are getting ready to deal with the aftermath of this cyber event, whatever that may look like. And we actually have some, we're starting to get some guidance. Uh, We actually have a court case that just uh, got uh, uh, decided and we have an opinion. And you know what, as always, when we have stuff that we talk about that has a legal implication, we like to bring on people who actually know what they're talking about. And uh, yeah, we're very lucky to have Rob Scott back on the program today to talk about all these uh, complex issues. Rob, welcome to MSP Zone. Thank you, Charlie. Happy Cinco de Mayo. It is a very happy Cinco de Mayo to you as well. Um, So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, but if you guys remember, if you've been a listener to MSP Zone, you've been to some of Rob's sessions at MSP World in the past, He's, he's talked a lot about uh, what to do after a cyber event. And we're going to progress that conversation today a little bit. And we're going to, we'll, we'll have some uh, in the show notes, some links back to that um, podcast. I'm, Rob, I think we did it last year sometime about what to do after a, a cyber event. But I, I want to start off with your uh, take on this court case out of the Ninth Circuit um, that actually. It's kind of interesting about what to do, what not to do almost in filing a cyber insurance claim if you've had a cyber liability event. Can you give a summary of what this Ninth Circuit decision is all about for us? Yeah, so this Ninth Circuit decision is interesting because the court determined that although the insured party had suffered a data breach, had a loss, and had had communications with the carrier regarding the factual circumstances underlying the incident, that the failure to file a formal notice of claim uh, was fatal to their ability to recover the insurance in that case. Um, And so what we had was a situation where someone had insurance, they paid a premium, And because of the way the claim uh, and uh, and communication with the carrier after the incident was handled, uh, they wound up with no ability to recover from their first party cyber liability policy. So everything was good. They had the policy. It was in effect. They paid the premiums. Uh, They had a legitimate event. They end up not being able to collect and recoup the money from the insurance company and it's because they didn't what didn't they do that was the issue here what what like what's the takeaway for the msp of what not to repeat what what they what they did which the court deemed to be insufficient is forward some correspondence from one of the parties in which was involved with the with the incident um and the carrier treated that as what they referred to as a notice of circumstances Uh, And then uh, later, without following up with the carrier to provide a formal written notice of claim, which is what the policy required to trigger indemnity of the carrier, because they did because the insured never did that, the court determined that the insurance company was not obligated to pay. And I'm assuming the the in between uh, situation is the uh, statute of limitations or something else ran out and and they ran out of time to make the claim in a, in a proper fashion. Is that uh, did I read that somewhere? The- yeah, well, it's, it's it's not so much the statute of limitations, but 
the failure to provide timely notice under the policy is what was at issue. Okay. All right. So I, I feel like we've, we've done a good job in communicating to the MSP community worldwide about, you know, general steps that you may want to take if you think that you've had a cyber event, right? If you think that you've had something internal to your MSP practice, especially, and you have cyber insurance, that's going to be something that your insurance covers. Um, Check, check, check my math, uh, my legal math here on this, Rob. But, you know, if, if it's a customer breach, that may or may not be the fault of the MSP, but and that may or may not dictate whose policy is triggered, the MSPs or the customers. Is that right? That's correct. And in some instances, you won't know um, until a further forensic examination or... Why um, wouldn't you know? Well, because it could be um, factual issues that are not fully understood regarding, you know, the nature of the incident from a technical perspective. Can you, I mean, can you give me an? Uh, I mean, can you give me a, a who, hypothetical? Who side, uh, who, whose email was actually compromised that resulted in the phishing email that um, gave rise to the loss? Was it uh, a compromise on? Uh, one party's email system or the others? Was it the MSP's internal email or was it the customer's internal email is what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the factual issues regarding um, what transpired from a technical perspective may not be fully appreciated at the outset. And therefore it's important um, to give notice of claim for all policies that might be implicated. Is another takeaway from this Ninth Circuit decision that MSPs ought to be faster to file a claim, or is it something else? Because I, I, I don't want to have a bunch of claims now, you know, coming out of the gate from MSPs who say, "Well, something. I think something happened. Let's just file a claim so we don't end up in, you know." with the Ninth Circuit decision going against us. That's not the takeaway here, is it? Well, it, there's some, some of that is the takeaway, which is uh, giving just general information about an incident is not sufficient under certain policies to trigger coverage. And therefore, the takeaway is if you're dealing with a potential security incident and there is insurance that may be implicated you need to review your policies carefully to determine the claims handling procedures that are set forth in the policy and see to it that either on your own or with the advice of a lawyer that has experience with these matters, that you're communicating appropriately with the carriers to preserve your rights. Uh, it's not about just willy-nilly filing claims. It's about understanding the procedures that need to be followed under each policy and making sure that you're following them such that if you find yourself in a challenge of the type that was involved in this Ninth Circuit case, that you'll have the documentation in your file to show that you complied with the policy and that your claim was properly communicated in terms of notice. That's the takeaway. Okay. So I, so I, I want to do a quick summary here, but I'm going to, I'm going to, call everyone's attention back to, um, and Rob, you may remember this, but I, I remember one of your sessions at MSP World many, many years ago. I want to say it's over 10 years ago. When, when you were talking about and first raised the issue, which was a novel idea at the time, and I think still is, is that when MSPs have a potential security issue, event, call it, that engaging with a lawyer... And I think this one, this particular fact pattern involved doing like a network scan, right? Trying to trying to figure out where the breach came from, doing some forensic uh, digging around in the MSP's network to figure out what actually happened. That if you do that with the assistance of legal counsel, you get some protections that you wouldn't otherwise have. Do you, do you remember that presentation? Yeah, and dealing with the concept of the attorney client and the attorney work product privilege as relates to the condu conducting of forensic or other uh, post-security incident investigations that are being uh, performed under the supervision of counsel 
uh, that that work is is covered by the work product privilege. And then when the lawyer communicates to the client the outcome of those um, analyses, those communication and, and the client responds, uh, those communications are protected by the attorney client privilege. And so uh, it's become fairly um, well recognized that when it comes to a security incident or breach, that given the amount of security and privacy regulation that exists, that it's a good idea to get your lawyer involved to advise you of what your obligations may be under various state laws, what your obligations may be under your customer contracts, um, and, and so forth. And, and it's important um, to really evaluate because you could have an incident and legally you have no obligation to the end users to notify. The obligation to notify is to the uh, MSP's customer in the context of GDPR. We're talking about um, breach notification. Control controller of the data, not the subprocessor. Right. Um, and uh, it's important, given the complexities of the various laws, to really um, evaluate. Uh, each incident uh, on its own merit, because so much of the legal analysis that has to take place is dependent on the nature of the data subjects that are at issue in terms of the breach. So you got to be thinking about, okay, we had an incident whose data was potentially compromised and where do they reside? Right. And each Each one of those records could involve different law, depending on the citizenship of the um, data subject. So, so Rob, the, it seems that I, I mean, we, we want to make things easy to understand for the MSPs who are probably saying, oh my gosh, an another, another thing we have to worry about. But in many cases, first of all, I want to level set this by saying that data breach underscores all of this. I mean, it's pretty much global. It's almost global. It's in, it's in, Many, many states, provinces, and, and countries all around the world already, and so it, it's. I would think of it at, at, from an MSP standpoint as as kind of baseline best practices for what you need to do, and which is you need to figure out what's going on. And there's going to be a disclosure event. We're, we'll get to that in a moment. But if that's driving the the motive behind an MSP saying, "I need to figure out what happened. Something happened. I don't know what it is." I got to figure it out. And that's, that's your point, Rob, earlier. Then should they always be reaching out to a lawyer like, like you guys before that happens? Or should they do that only after they have a little bit more information? Like what, what, was, what would be your guidance? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to just call your lawyer and say, I think something is wrong. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard, it's hard it's hard to give advice you know on that level of a factual you know um presentation uh, the, the point is that sometimes it's difficult to know uh, for example i'm working on cases frequently where the incident uh giving rise to the inquiry is one involving one of the vendor tools you know we've all heard about the big solar winds story but there are many others in which um tool vendors that support the msp community uh have a security incident or privacy incident that they then give some vague notice to the msp about you know three of your servers were implicated in a security incident Uh, and and in some instances, the MSP does not have the means to conduct the forensic investigation because the servers in question are, are owned, managed, hosted by third-party providers. Think of cloud, you know, solution providers. So there's going to be a logistical and other uh, challenge to getting access to that, is what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Yet the MSP has an obligation 
to its customers in its contract likely and under state law potentially, depending on the nature of the data subjects, to provide some disclosure, like you said, whether it's to notify the MSP's client or to notify end users. And um, that's really what the MSP needs to focus on is, you know, what happened and what are my obligations and to whom? And the what happened, you know, they're technical people. They're probably in a better position to determine the what happened than I would be. My job is to help them gather the evidence and close the loops on things like uh, the forensic report says um, there was a compromise of a system, someone gained access, but our records show that there was no exfiltration of any data whatsoever, uh, no data was uh, downloaded, no data, no files were um, um, sent anywhere. And at first blush, you say, oh, that's okay. But you got to go further and then look at the laws because a lot of laws don't require exfiltration. A lot of laws don't require downloading. As a trigger. As a trigger for an obligation to give notice. The mere compromise of a system under most laws is, not, is enough to give rise to notice. So they got in, they didn't necess- they may or may not have gotten anything, but they were in a place where they shouldn't have been. Correct. Correct. So you have to look at each law to look at the actual and precise language. And so my job in, in helping with the investigation is not so much the technical piece, but explaining the difference between exfiltration, downloading, and compromise when it comes to interpreting breach notice statutes. Um, and, and so that's where the lawyers need to be involved in relatively early in the investigation. It doesn't have to be, you know, immediately once you get an alarm from your um, uh, uh, threat software. <laughs> um, but, but certainly um, if, if you've got uh, been given factual information <laughs> that suggests that you may have a compromise leading to a legal issue, involving privacy, that's the, when you want to involve your lawyers and then shortly thereafter uh, or, or simultaneously uh, get your insurance carriers involved. And, and that's where we were talking earlier about it's important that you carefully manage those communications because as we see in this case from the Ninth Circuit, um, you know, even when they know what happened and you gave them notice of circumstances, Failure to give a notice of a formal claim can be fatal to a recovery, and that's a you know that's one of these administrative technicalities that you can get caught up in when the insurance policy clearly says you have to do X, Y, and Z, and you only do X and Y, then you haven't triggered the coverage. So, circling back and, and just kind of summarizing this back for for the listeners out there, so we, we've thrown a lot of stuff up there um, for you guys to, to think about. But I, I, I'm taking away a couple of things, Rob, from what you just said. One, not everything is going to mean a call to the lawyer. That's number one. Number two, there is a clock, right? There, 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 there's often, if it's not a data breach notification clock, then there's a, there's a filing clock or, or, you know, uh, the last maybe in, in the time sequence is a statute of limitations, but th- there's, there's a clock of, you want to be expeditious, right? I, I, what I'm sensing is you don't want to wait unnecessarily after you think something's happened. You want to get your hands around this very quickly and know as much as you can quickly so that you have the maximum number of options, including potentially filing a claim with your insurance carrier. Yes. Um, it's very important that you treat security incidents that could be privacy incidents, and those are two different things, uh, as urgent, you know, very time sensitive. You mentioned um, on the breach notification. I mean, some of them are like as soon as possible, 
and not later than 48 hours. I mean, these are like, you know, this is immediate. This is not uh, something that you put at the bottom of the file and get to it next week. Right. Yeah, everybody comes into the office. Everybody's working on this. We're, 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 we've got we've got the clock is ticking. Yeah, so it, it needs to be treated as an emergency. Right. No, I understood. And, and so the the and then getting back to the Ninth Circuit decision, which is that you're going to be generating a lot of paperwork, right? You're going to be generating generating a lot of data related to a a suspected or actual breach, and. Uh, or security event or privacy event, and you want to make sure that the formality of, and this is just my my summary of, of, of what you said about the, the Ninth Circuit cases, there's, don't forget the formality of just filing the claim because you may, you may be talking a lot about stuff. You may be saying, hey, this is a valid insurance claim. You may be, um, you know, commiserating or, or interacting with a variety of different parties but there actually has to be a claim at some point um, if you're going to involve the insurance carrier. That's correct, Charles. You really got to, once you get involved in a situation like this, you really need to evaluate, you know, what are the sources of coverage for the various parties? You know, it could be multiple policies per party and multiple parties policies in play. That might be an alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the point is that triaging the available insurance and developing a strategy to review the appropriate um, claims handling provisions of each is something that needs to be done very quickly in the process. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad for the for the party, you know, in that in that Ninth Circuit case who, you know, had everything, everything was straight up legitimate. And they didn't get paid. They didn't get compensated because they they failed to file the right form. And, and I mean, what what a what a horrible way to lose out on you know whatever. Forgot what the uh, the amount was. I don't know if it said, but it, you know, sounded like it was a, a pretty pretty substantial deal. Um, yeah, four eight million dollars. It's a pretty um, a draconian outcome for a technical um, failure. But again, the courts are not there to, you know, 100% do what's fair. I mean, they have to do, uh, it, it's, it, it, you know, initially they have to interpret the four corners of the agreement. Yep. And when the four corners of the agreement say, you know, we'll pay if, and one of the ifs is we receive a, you know, a proper notice of claim and you, allow us to take over the administration of the of the issue at that point you know the, the reason that this is there and 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 is because you know the carrier wants to if they've got to pay the check they want to you know shop for the groceries they want to be involved in in dealing with the investigation and the forensics and you know the good carriers that operate in this space have relationships with all the best forensic firms and and have the ability to to do things that maybe uh wouldn't have been thought of without their involvement so to to, to you know to try to give them the bill having failed to give them notice as required under the under the um policy you know it seems unfair to them in some ways on the other hand uh it would be also unfair to the insurance carriers if uh, the court were to determine that, you know, a vague general notice of circumstances or facts is sufficient to trigger coverage when the policies themselves, many forms of which are regulated by state law and have been reviewed by insurance commissions, et cetera, uh, don't say that. that. That would be improper as well. So, um it's interesting um, and 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 unfortunate um, in that case that it seems like you know someone wound up on the short end of the stick because they they paid for something they never got any value for and that and that's yeah. really the sad thing they they paid for the insurance they paid the premiums and when it all came down to it they got tripped up on a technicality that had them lose out on the benefit. So MSPs take away from today. Do not be the party in this case that 
suffers needlessly because of a failure to do something that is fairly simple and could have been done very easily. And that's the takeaway. And it's a it's a reminder to be ever vigilant about what your responsibilities are and about the options, the protections that you have already out there and not to let them go unused because they're there for your protection as, as an MSP business or division. Um, like I said, we're going to put this uh, article, uh, a couple articles up there um, uh, in the show notes for you guys to read a little bit later on. We've been actually getting some uh, emails, Rob, uh, be interested to know a lot about insurance. So we're getting some good comments and we're getting some people who are, you know, listening to these kind of topics about insurance, uh, cyber insurance specifically. So if you guys have, have any questions for Rob or myself on a future MSP Zone episode, maybe you want to join us, maybe you want to ask some questions, you want to have Rob, um, you know, expound on and give his opinion on, send us an email, uh, mspzone at mspalliance.com. And we'd love to, to hear from you guys. And, um, you know, uh, I think this is a, it's a complex issue, but Rob, you did a fantastic job at making it uh, easy to, or easier to understand. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. And uh, myself for Charles Weaver for MSP Zone. We appreciate you guys listening in. Until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a like. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast so you will get notified when future episodes are released. We will see you next time in the MSP Zone.